This video has light spoilers for Inside Job until the end where I'm gonna throw up a little warning. It's an outstanding show that you should watch immediately if you haven't. If you care about that, then leave a like and come back to this video once you're done since it's not going anywhere. Otherwise, on to exposing the deep state. For the past few years, I've really been off-put by American 2D animation. It seems like thought-provoking stories with arcs that you actually cared about were getting sidelined for the next Family Guy or Rick and Morty clone, forcing me to look east for the vast majority of my entertainment consumption. But that's not saying there isn't anything good that came out of America. Futurama, to this day, remains one of my favorite series ever. Gravity Falls is a show that I fell in love with because it pushed the envelope on what kinds of overarching stories can be told through animation. They had characters I cared about enough to remember long after I finished the series, and I can always see myself returning to them because they never overstate their welcome. That's in sharp contrast to your Simpsons or Family Guy that had impeccable starts and then became shells of their former selves after years and years of renewals. Zombies, if you will. And after its second season, Rick and Morty crapped the bed so hard because it squandered an interesting premise in place of overly nihilistic counterculture and meta-humor that undercut any tension that had been built up. And it seems like Netflix and HBO Max were throwing everything at the wall trying to recapture what made those shows so popular. This inevitably created a quantity over quality war that's currently being waged on these platforms. See, this wasn't really a problem when streaming services weren't as big as they are right now, and the only shameless clones were American Dad and The Cleveland Show. But now everything feels like a sea of sludge that you just have to wade through every time you doom scroll the streaming library. Brickleberry, Paradise PD, Farzar, The Prince, and Hoops are some of the worst and laziest shows to come out, and it just feels like you're consuming uninspired lazy cookie cutter production. Even when a show like Chicago Party Ant has an interesting premise, it falls apart because all of these shows force themselves into the mold of what they're trying to imitate. However, the worst offender of the downward spiral in American adult animation is spearheaded by Big Mouth. Like, you can't tell me all six of these seasons about children having sex have perfect critic scores. I mean, who is actually watching this crap? Everyone I know, anecdotally, has said that it is cringy, edgy, and a terrible show, yet it continues to get renewed season after season. I think the show almost single-handedly bolstered the stereotype of ugly American animation, being so popular that it was juxtaposed against the character design of Code Geass in my university's Japanese culture class. I'm not saying there are no talented people behind any of these shows, but you gotta call a spade a spade. The premises are derivative at best, and downright appalling at worst. See, we should have known that after Cuties, Netflix just has an unhealthy obsession with this type of content. But the prevalence of Big Mouth is directly attributed to what Netflix's CEO recently said in regards to the claim that they've never canceled a successful show. Quote, We've never canceled a successful show. A lot of these shows were well-intentioned, but talked to a very small audience on a very big budget. The key to it is you have to be able to talk to a small audience on a small budget and a large audience at a large budget. If you do that well, you can do that forever. So you can finally see why a show like this is slated for season after season of renews. It looks cheap, and it is cheap, and easy to make. Garbage in, garbage out. Most of these shows are. Which is so disappointing because animation as a medium can be the most creative way people express themselves. So if you're like me, and you have this tiny boat on the sea of utter garbage, imagine how excited I was to find an island. A show that appeared on its surface to be more of the same trite dog water that we've been drinking up for the last five years or so. A show that instantly skyrocketed to becoming one of my favorite shows in recent memory. A show that captured my sense of humor to a T. A show that hit so so close to home that it was basically sleeping on my couch. A show that I've wanted to gush about for so long. A show that was recently cancelled before it had a chance to fully spread its wings. This is everything Inside Job did right. <laughs>Job is a sci-fi workplace comedy about the deep state and how all the conspiracy theories we know are true, but with a twist. Everything from the moon landing, JFK's assassination, flat earth, mole people, lizard people, vampires in Hollywood, state-controlled media, chemtrails, the Mandela effect, the one that they can't even talk about, and so much more are all explored in hilarious detail. It's the brainchild of Shion Takeuchi, who worked as an artist for Pixar and a writer for Disney and other animated productions before creating Inside Job.
And her catalog of work is super insightful on why Inside Jobs stands out much more than other shows coming out. From Monsters University, Inside Out, The Regular Show, Gravity Falls, and much more, it's hard not to see how Inside Job captures a similar charm and emphasis on continuity. Alex Hirsch joined from Gravity Falls to help bring some of the same structure to Inside Job. But this show really feels like a passion project from Shion. You can tell just by looking at it that this series has a lot more personality and heart to it than its contemporaries. And while it does feel like a spiritual successor to Gravity Falls and how it tries to tell its story, for me personally, Inside Job went above and beyond in a shorter period of time. Inside Job is the most relatable show I have ever watched. It's a bit unnerving how many parallels I see between myself and the socially awkward, brilliant engineer of a main character, Reagan Ridley. Everyone else be like, Patrick Bateman's literally me, for real, for real, and I'm like, nah fam, Reagan's literally me, for real, for real. And I want to express why, but in order to do that, I need to go over why the premise of Inside Job works so well. The continuity and the world building of this show are excellent because of the subject matter. Conspiracy theories. Inside Job never shies away from direct references to real people, events, and trends by calling them by their real names instead of worrying about copyright infringement and creating fake characters that are supposed to be based off of real world equivalent. In this way, Inside Job is an equal opportunity offender. Look at their shirts! Criminalize laws, save the whales but kill all the bees, my other Volkswagen is an assault rifle, what the fuck does that even mean? Libertarians make no sense. Inside Job takes multiple pod shots at people and movements across the political spectrum. Despite the show being fairly niche, in its type of humor, this makes it very accessible to audiences who can get sucked in. Heck, my dad, who's not in the STEM fields like me, watched an episode and was skeptical at first, but was laughing really hard by the end of it. I know one common critique of Inside Job is the reference humor. Inside Job, more like Inside Joke but I actually think it enhances the experience even further. This could be because the structure of the jokes in Inside Job are a cocktail of reference humor, deadpan, science satire, and observational humor. A minimal amount of cutaway gags are used, which I really appreciate. I can understand that if you don't get the references, it might be a tad annoying, but they're not terribly uncommon, and I caught roughly 98% of them, considering the show does reference tons of my hobbies as a science-oriented thinker and worker. Watching Inside Job is like seeing my engineering and internet brain rot that I could never put into words finally be born through this show. It's the only show in 2022 that made me laugh out loud. But the reason the reference humor works so well, specifically for this show and less so for other shows in the animation genre, is because conspiracy theories at their core are just big references. You either know them or you don't. It works perfectly because the subject matter of the show complements it so well. And the way these jokes and references are interwoven into the plot itself is awesome too. Even the titles of each episode are amazing and intelligent play on words. And once again, references to other things. I think reference humor in a show about references oozes so much creativity. And this directly bolsters one of the best aspects of Inside Job, the world building. See, world building is pretty easy when you're a shadow government and you can build the world into being whatever you want it to be. And with the lore dump the show provided at the end of the first season, it's insane how much potential an IP like this really has. I think my favorite favorite example of world building comes from probably my favorite episode, We Found Love in a Popeless Place, where the shadow organization Cognito Inc. is contracted by the Holy Catholic Church to build a hell-themed theme park under Rome using old Disney animatronic tech that's going to be used to convert more people to the Catholic Church. If that sounded ridiculous, it is, and that's why this show is amazing. But what makes this specific episode even better is that it splits the gang up with Reagan and her boyfriend from the Illuminati, a rival company to Cognito Ron and have them accidentally raise hell in Rome while the rest of the cast is stuck in actual hell, the Denver International Airport. Whether it's the portal to Hollow Earth, a colony of hippies on the moon, the constant lambasting of Atlantis. Sure, we may have messed up in the past, but not as bad as those idiot Atlanteans. Fuck Atlantis! The Burning Man ripoff Bohemian Grove, Yale being full of reptoids, or Still Valley trapped in the 80s by chemtrails, each set piece is used to show you the influence and also incompetence of the shadow government. What helps the world feel like our own is that it's beautifully drawn. Even the backgrounds, like look at how these are made. It manages to stylize them with little markings of color as if the world itself is pinned on a corkboard, which segues nicely into the animation being so fluid. The show doesn't look like crap. 
and it probably was much more expensive than all the other Netflix animated shows to come out recently were. And as season one progresses, the animation's allowed to get a lot more experimental, like when Glenn and Andre are eating the Enlightenment shrooms. This show is incredibly kinetic, and it never feels cheap or lazy. Fight scenes and action moments hit so hard because the framing is so on point, and you can feel the inspiration it takes from Japanese anime. But none of this would matter if the stories and characters weren't solid too. Amazingly, Inside Job hits the nail on the head with that one as well. I'll talk about the plot briefly first because I want to delve into how inspired the main cast is. The general plot of Inside Job follows Reagan Ridley in her quest to run the company that Shadow governs the world, Cognito Inc. When we first meet Reagan, she's given the promotion to manage her team, the cast that we spend most of the show with. Gigi Thompson runs mass media manipulation, Glenn Dolphin is the first human dolphin hybrid military meathead, Andre Lee is the narcotics head of the organization, and Mike Celium is the mind-reading mushroom from Hollow Earth whose jucus is used to... <laughs> whose jucus is used in... <laughs> whose jucus is used in the company's mind wipe tech. While on the precipice of the promotion, Reagan is told by the current CEO, JR, that her people skills are just so bad that they need a yes man to ease productivity back up. That being the lovable frat boy himbo, Brett Hand. Dismayed, Reagan is pushed out of the company like her alcoholic father and co-founder, Rand Ridley. Just after solving AI and replacing the president with a robot, a robotus, if you will. But when Brett isn't able to lead the team and the AI goes rogue, Reagan and Brett come together to stop the president and keep the shadow government from being exposed. However, in secret, Reagan salvaged the murderous AI and stores it in the basement of Cognito. Wow, okay, that was a lot, and that's just episode one. <laughs> Part one of season one spends most of the time world building. We're given a tour of different conspiracies from Reagan's perspective, and it really shows how layered she can be. The characters are allowed to explain the twists on each conspiracy to Brett because he's new. This makes it a lot less forced when the show has to give exposition for its premises. Reagan's frustrations with her parents lead her to counsel with the trapped AI, now named Alpha Beta. As the gang goes through wacky antics and parodies a ton of famous IP, this leads to a whodunit at the end of part one, where Rand is reintroduced to the company under pretty ridiculous circumstances. Part one's strongest character moments come from Reagan herself, while the seeds of development are planted for the rest of the cast. Part 2 starts with Reagan at her lowest, which parallels beautifully to Rand at the beginning of Part 1. Everyone besides Brett seemingly giving up on her leads her to Anonymous Anonymous, an Alcoholics Anonymous for the Shadow Government, where she meets Ron Statler, an agent for the rival company, the Illuminati. Through their shared discontent for the companies they work for, Reagan and Ron manage to build a relationship and have believable, adorable chemistry as Reagan climbs closer and closer to her goal of taking control of Cognito. Meanwhile, the seeds of character development for Brett and Rand are finally budding into beautiful flowers, but there's still so many mysteries to uncover about the Shadow World. I mean, this show even has an in-universe solution to the plot holes, and it cracks me up every time I hear it. This to our timeline has caused a number of minor inconsistencies, plot holes, if you will. These plot holes were all caused by the machine. Very oh, sad. Future stuff too. All of the voices for the cast are just perfect. I mean, Christian Slater, the voice of Rand, also narrated Dinosaur Planet from the Discovery Channel, which was a great part of my childhood and is even funnier to revisit now. There's no food here. <laughs> Just sex. And I can't get over how well designed these characters are. For example, the asymmetry in Reagan, Glenn, and Alpha Beta makes them some of my favorite designs in the cast. The clean sleekness of JR clashes against the rugged look of Rand. Brett is essentially the physical manifestation of Comic Sans, and Mike's design is just wildly creative. All these characters, besides Brett, have strong silhouettes, a sign of excellent character design. And let's talk about the character names for a moment. This show is really sneaky about slipping in a ton of references. The main power couple of part two of season one, Ron and Reagan, is a nice nod to all of the conspiracy theories from the 1980s and the 40th president. Rand is a direct reference to Ayn Rand, the philosopher and thought leader of the libertarian movement, which the show actively jokes about. And I have a strong suspicion that JR's name is a reference to Dallas's JR, as Who Shot JR became not only one of the most viewed moments in television history, but a massive source of conspiracy theories that spread at the time. Now I could talk Talk about some of my favorite jokes or character moments, but we'd be here for hours on end. So what I wanted to talk about is something a bit more personal and tell you why this show spoke to me on a deeper level. There are massive spoilers for the end of season one incoming, so click to this point on screen or the next chapter if you haven't watched it. When I look in the mirror, I see a person like Reagan staring back. 
Not so much in her backstory, but how she is in her current situation, how she thinks about and handles problems, and what level of importance she puts on different aspects of life. I did have a totally different upbringing with a supportive family that helped me pursue the goals that I wanted to. Like Reagan, I struggled in school, though without skipping grades and showers, and graduated early because I'm a very work-oriented kind of person. This comes with a lot of benefits, but also means sacrifices have to be made that get tougher and tougher the further you go. See, the reason I love this show so much is because I went through nearly an identical situation with Reagan and what she did in her relationship with Ron. In the penultimate episode, Reagan confronts Rand, who is shifting realities to find him one where he, his wife Tamiko, and Reagan can live happily together. But through his paranoia and grievous actions, that reality doesn't exist. He's trapped in a prison of his own ambition, worse than any Shadow Prison X. And this situation is beautifully mirrored in the season finale, as Reagan is confronted between the choice of the goal she worked for her whole life and the love of her life who's wanting to escape the shadow government. Ron is plagued by regret for his actions, showing that he's a deeply troubled character with a lot of reservation. And the worst part about reality is that this ambition she has drives a wedge between the one she loves and the goals. You can't force incompatible things together. As Reagan learned, viewing simulations of every possible reality where her and Ron stay together. And she realizes she can't do it. She wipes herself from Ron's mind so that he can live a happy life in Appleton, Wisconsin with someone else. The reason this scene felt worse than any punch to the gut is because this happened to me. Minus the whole mind wiping thing, but I too had to leave someone I loved in the Midwest because of circumstances that my work forced me into. But work itself really didn't force me. I made that choice. You don't graduate college early, work overtime, and accomplish good results at work, receive awards and raises just to slow down. I'm not ready to slow down yet, and neither is Reagan. I'm at a similar stage in life to Reagan where I'm trying to establish myself in a huge corporation, and I have that drive and tenacity like her to make it work, but I have to leave so many things behind just to do that. I don't rely on YouTube as a job because I'm one of the many engineers making the world work and allowing people to have YouTube as a career option. Because I don't slow down, I actually got to accomplish a goal that I've had six years prior in going to Japan. But all that comes at a cost. While I was in Japan, I was alone and given plenty of time to think about these things. Reality hit me in that the world where I'm moving a million miles a minute, I'm probably not in a position to force someone to fit into my box. And I can't ask people to leave school for me. I can't do long distance halfway across the country, let alone halfway across the world. But I know that in doing this, I'm fulfilling my purpose in life. A purpose that others see in me, just like how others see it in Reagan. And that's why I was bawling my eyes out during the finale and getting a little choked up right now we even talking about this stuff. Yeah, I've never seen a show that fully encapsulates a deeply personal situation I've lived through, especially not an animated show. And I don't think it would be the same if another show did it. There's just something so special about the series that just clicks with me, showing me that it's going to be all right, that I made the right decision. And given the time I've had to reflect on this stuff, I finally got a chance to verbally express it through this video. And yeah, I want to thank you for listening. I have found a solution. One where Statler doesn't have to live with the memory of our breakup. Oh, but you do. Yeah, I didn't want to forget. I can understand if Inside Job isn't your favorite show. I can acknowledge that it's not flawless, but it is something that I hold near and dear to my heart. The medium of animation continues to bring me joy and connect me to some of the things I love most, which is why I try to be a small part of it here on YouTube with discussions about all aspects of animation and the stop motion animation series I love to make. For all these reasons, I'm beyond upset that Netflix would cancel this show. It was one of the top trending shows on the platform and it genuinely upsets me that we get six seasons of Big Mouth prioritized over something special like Inside Job. And if I was a rich millionaire with engineering money, not like I have it now, but maybe one day I would have it, no matter how much it cost, I'd fund the completion of this story any way possible. If I had the money to give, I would to make Inside Job work. People often ask why I vilify Netflix so much in my videos, and this is primarily because this is the second time they've taken a series I love and messed it up intentionally just for the corporate bottom line. I mean, I talk about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure a lot on this channel, and the mistreatment of Part 6 really affected my enjoyment of that season. And the many talented people who worked on Inside Job didn't need this to happen to them. And the greatest irony of all of this is that Netflix has the audacity to tweet out animation is art the day after they cancel one of the most creative animation projects on their platform. Now Inside Job might have been cancelled at the right time though. 
Netflix has shown time and again that they don't respect animation. But the same week that Inside Job was cancelled, Justin Roiland, the voice actor for both Rick and Morty, was arrested and facing felony charges for domestic abuse. While these charges were fake, trumped up, and eventually dropped, he's not working with Adult Swim anymore. Now Adult Swim has a Rick and Morty shaped hole in it even though they're committed to going to season 10. <laughs> I don't think that's going to pan out the way they want it to, but I imagine the quality of Rick and Morty is going to decline even further. There's a chance a show like Inside Job could dethrone that in ratings. I genuinely believe that. And I just so happened to leave some petitions in the description of this video <laughs> asking for the network to pick this show up. By making this video, I just hope to show some kind of love and appreciation for the series. And I really hope someone at Adult Swim or one of the other services out there is listening. So that's the video. I just wanted to thank you all for sticking around and being out there to let me talk about the things I love. If you want more videos like this, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and comment for what you'd like to see next on the channel. Have a beautiful Duang, and I'll see you all next time.